California lifts COVID restrictions. Police departments have trouble recruiting. And the White House wants to target QAnon supporters. Then more on this week's headlines. Welcome to America Uncovered, I'm Chris Chappell. Emails released by the House Oversight Committee revealed that former President Donald Trump and his allies pressured the Justice Department to investigate and challenge the results of the 2020 election. This revelation is absolutely shocking, is what I'd be saying if Donald Trump hadn't himself talked about this every single day for the past seven months. Everywhere Trump goes, he claims the 2020 election needs to be investigated and challenged, even while people tell him, Sir, this is a Wendy's. This news isn't surprising. It's barely even news. This is like saying leaked documents show that Bernie Sanders isn't a big fan of Combs, or Gargamel wants to destroy the Smurfs. We already knew that. The only real surprise would be learning that Gargamel and Bernie Sanders are the same person. It all makes sense now. Bernie looks out for the little blue guys so he can eventually eat them. Speaking of eating questionable meats, grill up some hot dogs, because the White House has announced plans to host a 4th of July Independence from Virus Day bash and encourage citizens nationwide to celebrate a return to normalcy. The U.S. is expected to fall short of President Biden's goal to have 70% of adults vaccinated by July 4th. But who cares? Let's party! When is celebrating prematurely ever come back to haunt a president? Fire up the grill. Because what better way to celebrate freedom from a respiratory disease than by loading up on burgers and giving ourselves heart disease? One state celebrating return to normalcy is California, which lifted almost all of its COVID restrictions on Tuesday. California Governor Gavin Newsom ushered in the state's full reopening at Universal Studios. And he was ushered in by minions. Please welcome to the stage, California Governor Gavin Newsom. Well, good morning, good morning Governor. Is that Optimus Prime? It's nice it is a privilege to stand by your side. <laughs> it is good to have you standing by my side. And off to a smooth start. Now the Californians are no longer wearing masks. Los Angelinos once again can enjoy breathing in the fresh air and showing off their sexy lip injections. It's a crime those were covered up for more than a year. Mmm. Looks just like the hot dogs the White House will be serving. Gavin Newsom announced that California would be rolling out a new vaccine verification system. Newsom was quick to clarify this vaccine verification system wasn't a vaccine passport, which has been a controversial issue I've covered recently. Newsom said it's not a passport, it's not a requirement. It's just the ability now to have an electronic version of that paper version. The decision to make people show proof of vaccination, which Newsom wants you to know isn't a vaccine passport, even if it looks, sounds, and even smells like one, will be left to businesses. I have to say the idea of a vaccine verification system isn't very practical. Because if you've ever tried dating in California, then you know they never wind up looking like their picture. As far as masks go, California will be using the honor system. This also isn't very practical. Because if you've ever tried dating in California, then you know they're never honest when they swear they're free from disease. Then again, just because you've received a vaccine doesn't mean you're safe as 899 people in New York City learned when they found out they were injected with expired Pfizer doses at a Times Square pop-up vaccination site. The first clue that something may have been wrong should have been that these shots were administered by the naked cowboy. The people who received these defective shots in Times Square said, okay, but the Rolex I bought for 30 bucks is legit, right? Or after the commercial break. Welcome back. Police departments nationwide are having a hard time recruiting new cops. It's no big surprise after a year of anti-police protests. 
Chuck Wexler, the executive director for the Police Executive Research Forum, said fewer people are entering the profession, while more are leaving through retirements and resignations. Police agencies are stretched thin and violent crime is on the rise. It seems while far-left groups haven't achieved their goal of defunding the police, they've so far at least been successful in depressing the police. Blue isn't just the color of their uniform, it's their mental state. This is happening amid an increase in crime, such as in San Francisco, where shoplifting has forced several Walgreens to close down. Some say if this trend keeps up, then the only viable solution is to make the RoboCop program a reality. Come on, RoboCop is a completely unrealistic movie. There's no way Detroit could ever look this nice. And the U.S. is going to need all the police they can get because the White House has unveiled a new strategy to counter domestic terrorism laser-focused on violence. It comes after the FBI released an intelligence bulletin highlighting the risk that adherents of the conspiracy theory QAnon may commit political violence. If you don't know what QAnon is, the New York Times says it's a viral pro-Trump conspiracy theory. I feel like Trump supporters might disagree with the connections being made. If QAnon extremists turn violent, that would definitely be a problem. But I feel like there's a bigger problem. Our politicians are so awful that when some guy on the internet says politicians are actually hollow earth-dwelling reptilian pedophiles, millions of people think, yeah, that would explain it. So what is the White House's plan to deal with these domestic terrorists? Part of it includes working with tech companies to identify and eliminate domestic terrorist content online. Some people, mostly on the political right, have expressed concerns the U.S. government will use this new focus on domestic terrorism to go after things that are not terrorism, like political speech. I wonder why people are worried about that. It's not like the government previously misused terrorism laws. But Attorney General Merrick Garland said we are focused on violence, not on ideology. In America, espousing a hateful ideology is not unlawful. We do not investigate individuals for their First Amendment protected activities. Of course, the government won't judge or suppress your speech. That's Mark Zuckerberg's job. Another part of Biden's plan is to improve screening and vetting of government employees to make sure people who could pose a threat are identified before being put in sensitive roles. Look, if you want to get rid of people in the government that pose the greatest risk of destroying America, then you can start by firing 98% of Congress. The only ones who can stay are the representatives from Delaware. Delaware is doing everything right. Did you know Delaware has surpassed Florida as the number one state for retirees? That's because of Delaware's superior economy, tax rates, and lack of cicadas hopped up on bath salts. Speaking of bath salts, Florida. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill requiring a minute of silence in all public schools. DeSantis wants to give students the option to pray if they want to, which is nice, because if you're growing up in Florida and plan on making it out alive, then praying is your best option. I say America should implement a mandatory eight hours of silence for all students. That way, it'll be harder for school shooters to find them. Yeah, that was a bit dark. Let's move on to a lighter topic. The Holocaust. Republican Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene has apologized for comparing mask mandates on Capitol Hill to Nazi policies. After a huge backlash, she decided to go to the Holocaust Museum to learn about actual Nazi policies. Turns out she may have exaggerated a little bit. There is no comparison to the Holocaust. And there are words that I have said, remarks that I've made, that I know are offensive. And for that, I want to apologize. This is evidence that with education, politicians are able to change their behavior. With that in mind, can we make every member of Congress visit the Museum of Campaigning on Actual Policy Solutions instead of attacking your opponent in an effort to present yourself as the lesser of two evils, even though you're both beholden to the same corporate interests? It's not the most popular museum, probably because it's hard to get into since the banner covers the entrance. More after the break. 
Welcome back. This week, President Biden signed a law making Juneteenth a federal holiday. Juneteenth was originally celebrated in Texas because June 19th, 1865, was the day that Union soldiers officially emancipated slaves in Texas after the Civil War. But over the years, Juneteenth has become a symbolic day to mark the end of slavery in the U.S. in general. The bill making Juneteenth a federal holiday unanimously passed the Senate earlier this week. And the House overwhelmingly passed the bill as well, with the only holdouts being 14 Republicans who voted against it. These Republicans said they objected to officially calling the holiday Juneteenth National Independence Day, out of concerns it could be confused with the July 4th Independence Day. I see both sides of this argument. On the one hand, some holiday names are confusing. For example, did you know that Boxing Day has nothing to do with wearing gloves and punching Canadians in the face? It's an honest mistake that anyone could have made, officer. But on the other hand, what's wrong with having more than one Independence Day? This is America, after all. As far as I'm concerned, every day is Independence Day. USA! USA! On Wednesday, President Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin met face to face at a summit in Geneva. After all the months of trash talking each other, it definitely wasn't awkward. When describing the goals of the summit, here's what Council on Foreign Relations President Richard Haas said. Can we get Russia to use force less indiscriminately in, in Syria? Can we get Russia to back off uh, some of its use of cyber? That to me is, is, is a realistic agenda. It may not seem like a lot, but to, to keep a bad situation from getting worse is sometimes all you can do in foreign policy. Oh, that's a great way for America to engage with Russia. Don't take a tough stance. Don't try to get what we want. Just beg them to give us less of what we don't want. It's like saying when you go to Burger King, your goal isn't to get a Whopper, but to not get spit in your onion rings. Topics discussed behind closed doors supposedly include Iran and North Korea's nuclear capabilities, Syria, climate change, human rights abuses, and COVID-19. And Biden was tough and stood his ground against a reporter that asked him a question he didn't like after the meeting, though he did later apologize for being rude. The U.S. president was rude to a journalist? It's just another sign that Biden plans to continue Trump's policies. The U.S.-Russia talks were expected to last four to five hours, but ended in under three hours. Officials described the meeting as constructive with no hostility. So constructive, I assume, that the two leaders solved all their issues in just three hours. And then one of them took a nap. It was Putin, of course. The U.S. also brought up the topic of the Russia-based ransomware attacks on U.S. infrastructure. In a post-summit conference, Putin said both sides have to assume certain obligations there, and that the U.S. and Russia will begin consultations on cybersecurity. I assume those consultations will be the U.S. saying, please stop attacking us, and Russia saying, well, think about it. But overall, these talks went about as well as could be expected. The two countries will soon negotiate a treaty limiting nuclear capabilities, and U.S. and Russian ambassadors will return to their posts, which will likely upset the ambassadors since, like many of us, they got used to working from home over the past year. It's so nice to see diplomacy winning over violence. What's that, Shelley? Again? It turns out violence has won over diplomacy this week. Israel and Hamas resumed hostilities ending their ceasefire that lasted only a few weeks. After Israeli nationalists marched through a Palestinian neighborhood in Jerusalem, Hamas launched incendiary balloons at Israel, causing at least 20 fires on Israel's southern border. This is the most destruction caused by balloons since a gender reveal party. Still getting our money's worth from last week's Photoshop. In response, Israeli jets struck targets in Gaza. This all comes days after Israel got a new prime minister, Naftali Bennett. I know Bennett wants to set a strong tone for his administration, but maybe he should consider Richard Haas's advice on foreign policy. Instead of trying to get peace between Israel and Hamas, maybe Bennett should just try to not get spit on his onion rings. Otherwise, soon Gaza is going to wind up looking almost as bad 
as Detroit. So what do you think about the stories we covered this week? Let us know in the comments below. And remember, America Uncovered is supported mainly by viewers. Be sure to visit patreon.com slash America Uncovered. Contribute a dollar or more per episode. We rely on your support to help us keep making great episodes. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching America Uncovered.